ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد all praises due to allah we praise him we seek his aid and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his servant and his messenger. Indeed, the best speech is that of Allah, and the best guidance is that of his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the worst thing in the religion are the newly invented matters and all the newly invented matters in religion are innovation and every innovation is misguidance and every misguidance leads its people to the hellfire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm very happy and glad to be here. Uh, and it's an honor for me to be at Masjid al-Huda here in Bradford. So I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate uh, you staying here and listening to this lecture. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, sweetness in Salah. There is a strong connection between the way a person or the manner in which a person prays and the position he is going to make into paradise. There is a strong connection between your rank in paradise and the amount of khushu' focus that you find in the prayer. Strong connection. These are not my words, but I will relate, inshallah, uh, mention the name of the originator of, this, of these words later on, inshallah. I just want you to imagine someone walking into the masjid, he prays, whether individually, he prays his sunnah, or he prays with the imam and jama'ah, and in the middle of the prayer, let's say he has a beard, and he's playing around with his beard, just doing like that. Okay, do you think this person really is concentrating in what he is doing in his prayer? No, no. Okay, the answer is no. Let me ask another question. Focus, concentration, which is in other words khushu' or the reason, the root of khushu' Which place or where does it take place? The heart. The heart. Excellent, the heart. Khushur is in the heart, yet you can't see this man's heart. His focus is in the heart. But you made a judgment about his heart without being able to see his heart. You just saw him, his, you saw his external behavior, and you passed a judgment on his heart that he doesn't have khushur. Why? Because of the action? Yeah, you saw his action, but you passed a judgment on his heart. Does that make sense? Who does it make sense to? Let me see the hands, put them up so I can see them. Okay, who believes that this is not a justified judgment? And that we cannot actually pass a judgment? Almost equally, who's not sure? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I side with uncle here, with the first answer. There is a very strong connection between your heart and your actions. Actions stem from the heart. It's impossible for someone to be interested in something, yet not have his actions gravitating towards that thing, which he loves or he's, he, has fo he has some kind of concentration or focus on that thing. Wherever the heart goes, the actions will flow. Wherever the heart goes, the actions will flow. Okay? If you have noticed, I've been paraphrasing a statement from the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger ﷺ said, Indeed, there is a piece of flesh or a morsel of flesh in the body. If it's sound and intact, the rest of the body will be sound, will be in good shape. But if it's corrupt, the rest of the body will be corrupt. Indeed, it is the heart. So the secret of a human being is, a, is, is the heart. Obviously, 
Your judgment cannot be final. And this is why we're not supposed to judge people's intentions. But roughly speaking, it's a strong cue or, or clue. When you see someone, you see their external behavior, you can have a good idea of what's going on in their hearts. Okay? Now, when you see someone okay, playing around with their beard or probably you know, checking their watch, making sure time is right, or maybe even searching in their pockets, you would automatically think, okay, this man doesn't have khushur, he doesn't have focus in the prayer, he's not really concentrating on the things or the dua, the adhkar that he's reading. That's a very valid statement, because that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. There was a man at the time of the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid praying by himself, and he was doing that. Okay, playing around with his beard. The Prophet ﷺ made a beautiful statement. And he was teaching his companions. And we'll come to the style of the Prophet ﷺ when he teaches. The Prophet ﷺ said, as the companions were watching this man, he said, لَوْ خَشَعَ قَلْبُ هَذَا لَخَشَعَتْ جَوَارِحُهُ Had the heart of this man okay, been in a state of khushu' it would have reflected on his limbs, on his actions, external actions. So whatever state the heart is in, you'll find your body in. For someone who falls into anything that is haram, and they say, well, you know, uh, iman is in the heart, faith is in the heart. Yeah? They don't pray, they might drink, they might do different sorts of bad things, okay? You can name them. And he says, you come and advise him, and he says, you know, Iman is in the heart. We know that this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Does it make sense? What's in the heart has to be refl reflected on the actions. So if your actions are evil, be sure that there's something wrong with your heart, seriously wrong with your heart. If your heart is in good shape, definitely it's going to reflect on your actions, period. As simple as that, okay? Now, our challenge, our challenge is to de find out the sweetness in salah, okay? Let me ask a question and see how many hands we, get, we have. Who feels sweetness as they perform the prayer every day? Who ha you know, who finds this kind of khushu' and this state of mind, this peace and sweetness? Who experiences, experience, who, who has the opportunity to experience this every day? No one? Okay. Who experiences this feeling, let's say once a week, at least? Once a week. Put your hands up. By, by the way, there's no showing off here. Because the Prophet ﷺ used to ask similar questions just for the sake of learning and teaching, okay? So who, roughly saying, experiences the sweetness of the prayer, the beauty of the prayer, this kind of focus in the prayer, at least once a week? I'm one of them, <laughs> okay? Okay, good, good, which is good. Who experiences this feeling once a year? No one. No one, no one. Okay, just put Ramadan, Okay, out of this equation, because Ramadan is, is something special, outside Ramadan. Just your normal daily prayers, your normal daily prayers. Okay, who experiences this feeling once a month? No one. Did you notice something? We have two extremes here. You either don't experience that at all, or you either experience that in our case study, in our sample here, uh, once a week, at least. There's a very interesting phenomenon here. Very interesting phenomenon. And I will use it later. I'll use it later. So I'm, I'm building blocks now, and inshallah all of them will be put together at one, at one point in time. Going back to the Prophet's style of teaching. The style of teaching that we use with our kids and our probably our friends and even ourselves sometimes, is go and learn some principles and start t teaching people how they should behave. We always tell the kids, okay, you know, the pr in the presence of elderly people, don't talk, remain silent. Uh, when we go to the shop, yeah, don't give me trouble. 
and so on and so forth. When you go to school, do this. When you come to the masjid, do that. And most of the time, the kids don't abide by this. Because we're not using the Prophet's style in teaching. The Prophet ﷺ, if you noticed, he came to Mecca. Let me put it another way. Something happened in Medina one day. In the house of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. We know the famous companion, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. No, I'll take a story which is actually even m more telling. It, it helps me more. This is a house of one, one of the Ansar. One of the Ansar. There was, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was there. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's uncle. Hamza was there. Some other companions were there. Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to marry Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he was sitting at home, and he was feeling frustrated about something. Now he had uh, a servant girl or a maid. She approached him. She was an elderly woman, and she said. You know, somebody asked for the hand of Fatima. Are you going to stay at home forever? <laughs> when are you going to take action? <laughs> she said, people are asking for the hand of Fatima. Guess who asked for the hand of Fatima? Do you know who? Umar, Umar asked for the hand of Fatima, yes. But there was someone, someone was before, went there before Umar. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr As-Siddiq radiallahu anhu asked for Fatima's hand in marriage. But the Prophet ﷺ did not accept his proposal. Umar approached the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ did not accept his proposal. Then this woman rushed to Ali and she said, go ahead, do something. <laughs> you know, as they say in some countries, pull your socks up. <laughs> go ahead. He said, How, you know, what can I do? I don't have anything to offer her as a dowry, as a mahar. I don't have anything. She said, you just go on the Prophet we'll, we'll find out a way. So he goes to the Prophet and he sits there. And Zayd ibn Haritha was with the Prophet Ali ibn Abi Talib sits there very shy, embarrassed. He doesn't know how to initiate a proposal. He sits there because he doesn't have anything. He's sitting there, troubled, a bit nervous. The Prophet ﷺ looks at him and he says, Hey Ali, why did you come here? Uh, Ali said, well, nothing. The Prophet ﷺ said, maybe you came here to ask for the hand of Fatima. <laughs> In a very fatherly fashion. Obviously, I just want you to visualize, see that as a movie. Ali ibn Abi Talib is sitting there, he doesn't know how to initiate the proposal. The Prophet ﷺ asks him, why did you come here? He says, nothing. He said, maybe you came to ask for the hand of Fatima. Imagine what was the response of Ali ibn Abi Talib. <laughs> baffled. <laughs> he was baffled. The Prophet ﷺ said, why are you hesitant? He said, I have nothing to offer her. The Prophet told, ﷺ told him, what happened? You know, what happened to uh, a dirah, an armor that I gave you in the, in the time of Badr? The Prophet, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, it's, it's worth nothing. But the Prophet ﷺ then married him. But Ali ibn Abi Talib before that had two camels. Two camels. Camels are very expensive, even at that time. If you had a camel, you were considered to be relatively rich. Ali ibn Abi Talib had two camels, he lost them in one day. This has to do with Hamza and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf عنهم, and they were, as they were sitting in that home. Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to get himself ready for Fatima before he approaches the Prophet So he had the two camels. One that he got, uh, that was his share from the spoils of, of Badr, spoils of war from Badr, and another camel given to him by the Prophet So he was there and he was trying to get more money, more cash in order to uh, marry Fatima. So he left them in the market, in a parking lot, and he went to do some business with a man. When he came back, he found his camel, or both his camels, cut into pieces. 
they've, you know, they had been slaughtered, they've been cut into pieces, their guts have been, you know, put in, in the street. Ali ibn Talib, look at that, he couldn't believe it. Now his dreams are vanishing. Camels are gone, there's no marriage. Ali ibn Abi Talib was about 23 at the time. Guess what did he do? Ali ibn Abi Talib, the strong warrior, this great man, do you know what he did? He was in tears. He cried. So he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he rushes into the house of the Messenger ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ looks at Ali ibn Abi Talib in tears. He says, what's wrong? What happened? He said, Hamza. Hamza slaughtered my camels. Hamza slaughtered your camels? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Hamza is your uncle and my uncle. Why should he just slaughter your camels? And he didn't do anything with it. He didn't eat, even like eat them or prepare them for food. He just cut them into pieces and throw them. The Prophet wants to find out what's the story. So he goes to the house of that Ansari. He goes to the house, knocks the door. He gets permission to go walk in. And he looks at Hamza and he says, why did you do that? Hamza looks at the Prophet and he was reclining back. He looks at the Prophet head to toe. And he looks at Ali like that and he says, you're only servants, you're only slaves of, for, that belong to my father. That's Hamza. Do you know why? He was drunk. Hamza radiallahu anhu was drunk. He was intoxicated. Could you believe that? Hamza was intoxicated. And the other companions were drinking. <laughs> By the way, they were together drinking. But we know that alcohol, khamr is haram. Do you believe that Hamza was drunk? Do you believe so? I think that's a true story. Why? Any explanation? That was before. Before khamr was made haram. That was before Khamar was made haram. What's my, my point behind this story? The Prophet ﷺ, most of the time, he did not give his companions direct instructions. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. Most of his teachings were not direct instructions. The Prophet ﷺ would give the general frame for people, believe in Allah, explain to them the meaning of life, okay? Put them in the right mindset, and then everything would go in the right direction. Everything would go in the right direction. And that's the reason why most of our teachings don't, are not effective. Because we try to tell people what to do, but we, we, put, we never put them in the right mindset. The Prophet ﷺ would always make use of whatever situation he was in to teach people. That's, how, that's the best way you teach people. I know someone who managed to get his, his children from a young age to prefer death to drugs. They would die and they would never touch or come close to drugs or people who, you know, who uh, use drugs. Do you know how? They, he took them from an early age to a place, it was a uh, car park, multi-story car park. He took them there and this place was, you know, full with drug addicts, homeless people taking drugs. And it was saturated, obviously, with the smell of urine and all this filth. He took him from that early age to that place. When they saw people in that state, and they saw younger girls, drug addicts, offering themselves to people passing by. When they saw that, they associated a lot of disgust and hatred to, alcohol, uh, to, to drugs. So he says, late after that, his kids were exposed to drugs so many times and drugs were always out of the question to them. That's exactly how we should teach our children. Give them a real life experience rather than just keep telling them how things should be. And that's exactly how the Prophet ﷺ taught the companions. So going back to the man who was playing with his, beards, with his beard. The Prophet ﷺ, okay, I, as far as I know, there's no hadith that says if someone plays with his beard, then that shows his heart is not concentrating in the prayer. But the Prophet ﷺ, you know, uh, used that incident 
in order to teach the companions. Had this man been in a state of khushu' and focus, he, you would never find him playing with his beard. Okay, so that's the way we should learn. Okay, our salah and our khushu' and so on. And this is the way we should use with our kids how to teach them, our friends. Whenever you see something, okay, teach them. Use that opportunity, seize the opportunity and teach them something real. It's, it's it, you know, it sinks in a hundred times better than bringing a hundred books and tell, tell your kids, okay, learn this, learn that. Because it's a real experience. It incorporates more senses. It, it, it incorporates the feelings. People can connect on an emotional level to that experience and they could learn it and it could be an experience for a lifetime. Okay? Now, I think this helps us realize that if we want to find the sweetness in the prayer, okay, our focus should not be primarily on the physical reality of the prayer, which is important. The Prophet ﷺ said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. Why is this? Because that's how we should pray. Why is this? Because if we pray in the manner in which the Prophet ﷺ prayed, you will find a huge difference in your salah. And this is the factor number one in having sweetness in salah. Keep that in mind. That's number one. Okay, now we got into the main topic or the main subject of this, of this talk. You want to have, find the sweetness of salah, learn how the Prophet ﷺ prayed and exactly pray just like that. That's the number one. Now, where do we get this from? We get this from the fact that Allah is the all-wise. Allah is Al-Hakim. What does wise mean? In Arabic, Al-Hakim means the one who doesn't do things for no reason. The one who doesn't legislate things for no reason. Everything in Islam is carefully chosen by Allah. Everything. The smallest thing in Islam that you might think is trivial, unimportant, insignificant, has a reason, or there's a reason that Allah made it that way. And it has an impact that you should expect from it. So many times people say, you know what, a difference doesn't make to put your hands here or here, whether to, uh, you know, say Allahu Akbar, put your, Rafa al-Yadayn, put your hands up, or whether you put your hands on your knees as you make uh, ruku'ah, Okay, left, right, center, whatever you want to put, whatever you want. What difference does it make? I'm just making salah. Well, yes, ultimately you're making salah, but everything the Prophet ﷺ did in the prayer has significance. Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, Ala lahu al wal amr. To Allah belong the creation, and to Allah belong the legislation. Two things, creation, legislation. Allah created us in a certain format, physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, even socially, and he sent down a way of life, a system that is completely compatible with our creation. Completely compatible with our creation. Just like a lock and its key. Exactly. You cannot open that lock except with this key. Even if you get a key that is similar, but it's slightly different, slightly different. And even you might sometimes be unable to tell the difference between both keys. One of them would open the lock and one would not. That's exactly how Islam works with our human nature. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes the Prophet he said, لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُمْ If the Prophet were to obey you, if he were to follow your desires and your preferences, you would put yourselves in extreme hardship. SubhanAllah, even in your seeking ease, you will ultimately put yourself in hardship. Well, the uh, financial crisis in the world, the economic crisis in the world is, is, is a clear example. People wanted ease. People wanted uh, you know, lack of control in terms of in their financial system. This is why riba is halal for them, interest. A lot of the manipulation that is taking place in the financial world and economic world, okay, people are seeking ease. They want more money, they want more affluence, they want more control over the world. But ultimately, what did they do? They made it even hard for themselves. 
Okay? So that's exactly what this verse is saying. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Islam in all its details compatible to your nature. Exactly. There's perfect match. If you miss out on any point, it's going to make a difference. It is going to make a difference. So even the place or where you place your hands in salah, okay, it makes a difference. Yes, your prayer is still valid, but it does make a difference. There's a reason. Allah does not legislate anything, even if it's tiny, minute things, except for a reason. There's something. Allah doesn't do things randomly. Okay? So the way the Prophet ﷺ prayed is one excellent way to help you reach your khushua. But that could take you probably halfway through. What could bring about the sweetness of the prayer? If you understand the concept of khushu'a. Let me take some definitions. How do you define khushu'a? You might say humility. I understand. I need you to explain more. No general words. Who knows? How do you define khushu'a to yourself? That's a word we always use. How do you define khushu'a? Concentration is not exactly khushu'a. It leads to khushu'a. Sin just one second. Sincerity is not khushu' in itself. It's strongly related, but it's not khushu'. Humbleness. Humbleness. Yes, humbleness is part of khushu'. It's a great part of khushu'. Humbleness. But can you dig anyone can dig a bit deeper? When you are at ease, it's, it's around the same, it's around this, the same level. I need something deeper. Excellent. Did you hear that? When the heart is connected to Allah. That's the essence of khushu'a. That's the secret of salah. Honestly, that's the secret of salah. When the heart is connected to Allah in the prayer, that's khushu'a. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ra'd, Allah says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Those who have believed and their hearts find comfort, tranquility in the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the remembrance of Allah. Indeed, indeed, with the remembrance of Allah, with I would paraphrase it now, with awareness of Allah, with connection with Allah, the hearts are at ease and are in a state of tranquility. Okay, so that's excellent, very good point. That's where khushu'a comes from, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, you remember the question that I asked who finds khushu'a, who experiences khushu'a and salah? Let me ask you. Who, a general question, it's not related to Salah. Who experiences khushu' on a daily basis? Apart from Salah. That might be a surprise to you. But who experiences khushu' on a daily basis? Experience it on a daily basis. No, I'm, I'm saying khushu' Incorporating the meanings you all mentioned. Not Salah, you Yes, outside. The prayer. Okay. Do you know who experiences khushu' most these days? Lovers. Lovers experience khushu'. What did the brother say khushu' is? Essence of khushu'. Connection to Allah. What do lovers have? Connection to their beloved ones. What happens? They develop this focus, yeah? This focus about their love, the person they love. And have you, have you ever dealt with someone, with, let me say, a young man who loves a woman? Let's go a bit deeper into human nature because it helps us understand what khushu is. You know, many times <clears throat> there's a problem with the way we, we understand or we relate to our deen, by the way. You can find someone who's practicing. Praise the, five, uh, praise the five daily prayers in the masjid, 
reads a lot of Quran could be half of as well. Yeah. Excellent. Like a perfect Muslim. Go and see him in the market, cheats, lies, and does all sorts of bad things. It's schizophrenic. Two personalities. And you think that's uncommon? Very common. All around the Muslim world. All around the Muslim world. That's one of our biggest problems. Okay, back to the lover. Have you... Let me ask the question. Who has ever experienced someone, don't tell me about yourself, but about someone. Have you ever seen a lover, someone who's truly in love? Who, who hasn't seen someone in love? Could you ever have a proper conversation with that person? Impossible. Impossible. Because whatever you talk about, they're going to always gravitate to, their, to the person they love. Everything. Yeah? They might love like a girl, and you talk to them about cars. You talk to them about football. Okay? You start talking about football, about this team, that team, Manchester United, Liverpool, uh, Arsenal, etc. Okay? And then, all of a sudden, this person can find a connection in your conversation and bring it back to the girl they love. You can never hold a proper conversation with them. What is this? It's khushur. It's devotion, it's connection. It's connection. That's what we need to have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even better than that. By the way, that's not my own analogy. That's Ibn al-Qayyim's analogy. Ibn al-Qayyim uses that analogy. He says when you see someone in love, you, know, you can never talk to them. You can never have a proper conversation with them. They would always find a connection to the person they love and they will bring back the conversation to that point. That's their reference point. That's where they live. That's where the heart is. That's where the khushu' is. That's it. And when they think about their love, there's extreme focus. Whatever, they, whatever you talk to them about, they're, they're not interested. And this is why they bring it back to their love. If it has to do with the person they love, you know, they're all ears and eyes. And they listen to you, they focus and everything. That's khushu'a. And when they think about their love, how do they look like? Huh? As if they've, they're in this ocean of dreams and they're in a different world. You see, it's that khushu'a. It's that khushu'a. It's there, you know, the whole faculties are in one direction. That's what khushu'a is. And that's what we need to do when it comes to our prayer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, how can we develop khushu'a? We said pray as the Prophet ﷺ prayed, that's number one. Keep it in mind. I'll give you about four or five points, quite easy. But I'm just going around them, okay, jumping left and right to give you a different taste about different, each, each of these points. Then all what you need to remember is these four or five points done. Simple. How we develop khushu'a? Now, based on the lover's analogy. How do we develop khushu'a? By understanding what the lover is saying. Or the person in love is saying. Say, or whatever you're listening to. That's, that's step number two. Excellent, that's step, step number two. I, I want step number one. Huh? What, what the lover is interested in. What, what makes the lover happy. Love. That could be number two, number three. Okay? Focus. No, focus is a result. What did you say? Be in love. Be in love. Just be in love with Allah. Be in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take this as a general rule. And if, you, if your handwriting is good, okay? Hang it on your wall. Whatever you love and you are attached to will be on your mind in the prayer. Try it out. Now I'm gonna just do an exercise with you. You don't keep it to yourself, okay? But it will be it will help you a lot. See how you pray. Now in the Maghrib prayer, as we were praying. In the Maghrib prayers, we were praying, or let me say the Asr prayer. Because Maghrib, the loud prayers sometimes could help you concentrate because the Imam recites loud. Asr prayer, when you prayed Asr today, 
what was in your mind when you prayed Asr today. Even if you have a short memory, it's been less than two, hour, two hours. So you should, should, you should be... Do you want an honest answer? No, no, keep it to yourself. <laughs> keep it to yourself. But it's, it helps you understand, okay, the issue of khushua. What was on your mind when you, when you prayed Asr today? People who are usually in business and trade, they mainly think about their business. If a guy is in love or a girl is in love, they would be thinking about the person they love. Uh, if someone loves their, their job so much, or their field of study so much, they would be thinking about that. If someone loves themselves so much, they'll be thinking about themselves. So what you mainly think about in the prayer, okay, that's your ultimate love. Truly, your ultimate love. So you, if it's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you need to recheck your heart. There's something you need to, to do with your heart. Okay, that's the good point. You need to be in love in order to have khushu and salah. So you need to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the challenge. How do we love Allah? How do we love Allah? Okay, let me tell you about... Uh, there's a person, his name is Walid. Walid. He lives in Jordan, my country. Walid lives in an area called Jabal and Nasr. Okay, it's, it's like a, a hilly area. They call it Jabal and Nasr. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Out of the blue, do you love Walid? Do you hate Walid? Why, why don't you love Walid? But I do. <laughs> you see, how, how, do you, how do you expect yourself to love someone you don't know? How do you expect to love someone you don't know? If you don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you think you will love him? You might think you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but is this the case? Is this the case? We said, going back to the lover's analogy, very, very practical, by the way. Okay, do you think someone, <clears throat> and th there's an interesting thing, it's, it's like an upward spiral. When you love someone, okay, you become motivated to learn more about them. The more you learn about them, the more you love them. The more you love them, the more you are curious to know more about them. It's an upward spiral. That's exactly the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that's exactly the case. How do you expect to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowing Him? A lot of us think, no, let's, let me put this to the test. How do you think we can know Allah? Now, now let's say, okay, one day you decided, I want to know more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Sorry? No, no, be specific. I know it's through, through the Prophet, but exactly tell me, what would you go... If you had something, okay, or you, you said, okay, today I'll do something, I want to know more about Allah today. By 8 o'clock today, I want to know something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something significant. Quran. Quran. Be more specific. Looking around you. Research and reading what? 99 names. Reading the 99 names. Reading what? Within ourselves. Within ourselves. Okay. Ask. Oh, that. Okay. General. Very general. Ask someone. Okay. <clears throat> the most common answer that I got when I asked this question was, learn the ninety-nine names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Yeah. Which is a good idea, but who has read the ninety-nine names of Allah? Not necessarily all of them, the majority of them were familiar with them. But how much did you learn from them? You know, when you take the names and attributes of Allah out of their context, you can hardly get anything from them. And that's why some people say, okay, let's teach the names and attributes of Allah. Let's teach the names of Allah. That's the 90 names of Allah. That's, this course is about the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, they take the uh, name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ar-Rahim. 
They start explaining it, they try to put some context to it, but most of the time it doesn't work. Most, most of the time it doesn't work. And that's the difficulty in teaching the names and attributes of Allah. Not the rules pertaining to them, but their meanings and their implications. You cannot, you cannot, you need to teach these names in real life situations. Let's say someone is in trouble. You start helping them, okay, go through their problem and linking everything you do towards the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only then you can, your heart will start be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only then. Okay. Reading through the Quran is a good experience, but most of us don't do enough contemplation. So that, this is why we don't get enough. Uh, reading through the world, most of us do it, but we don't do it the right way. Yeah, we start instead of saying, okay, linking everything or tracing everything back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instead of doing that, okay, we get taken by the beauty of the creation of Allah and we stop halfway. We don't carry on. So, how do we get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's no one thing. You need to do all of these things together. First of all, first of all, you need. If you want to know how much you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to know how much you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Take this example. And that's a friend of mine as well who studied in Germany for about eight years. His mother could not read or write. She was illiterate. At that time, there was no internet, there were no more mobile phones. The only way of communication was sending letters. He would send a letter every month. One letter every month. His mother could not read or write. When she got the first letter, she went to her neighbor, her friend. She asked her to read the letter for her. She read the letter and she was in tears. That's her son. And this specific son had a special place in her heart. SubhanAllah. Second month, she did the same thing. Third month, she went and that lady wasn't in the country, was out of town. So that day she, was, she didn't have anyone to read for her. Her other sons were in school. So she was frustrated for most of the day. Until one of her sons came back from school, she said, read that for me, please. But she was drained at that time, emotionally. When she had this experience, she said, I'll make sure this never happens again. What did she do? She taught herself how to read and write. She literally learned how to read and write just to read the letters coming from her son. So she, she, she could, now she could read and write. Now the question is, do you think she loves her son? How much? She loves her sons, as you say, she loves her son to bits. <laughs> yeah. I start, by the way, I started to pick up the, the northern the Yorkshire accent. <laughs> she loves her son to bits. <laughs> <clears throat> now my question, oh, this woman used to, after she could read, and even before she could read, she, she always had these letters in front of her. She would hug the letters, look at them, and after she learned reading, she would read them every day. Now my question, this woman loves her son so much, this is why she would read his letters every day. My question is, how often do you read the letters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How often do you read the book of Allah? When last did you read the Quran? How often do you do it? Do you feel the attachment as you read the Quran? That's the question. Now you putting your feelings to the test. A lot of, you know, many times we like to, you know, be in favor of ourselves, not face the reality. But with a lot of analogy, you know, we'll be shocked at what we do. Now this woman obviously is a human being and she loves her son so much. And that's what she, why she would read his letters every day. And that's why she took the pains. For all her life she never bothered learning how to read or write. 
but she learned how to read just because of her son, because of she loves her son. Now, how much do you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Don't tell me, but keep the answer to yourself based on how often you read the Quran. That's it, simple. Now, there's another woman. <coughs> Let me see, what books do you have here? Okay, who has ever read the series on Iman by Dr. Umar al-Ashqar? Uh, what is it called? It's translated into English. What is it called? Islamic Creed, Islamic Creed series. Six or seven books. Six. Belief in Allah, belief in the last day, belief in the angels. Six articles of faith. Okay. It's a very famous book, even in, Eng in English and Arabic and Spanish and French and many languages. By Dr. Umar al -Ashqar. Okay. Uh, there was a woman, and she lives in Jordan as well, in Amman. She was 70 years old. She was illiterate, could not read or write. Yeah. She did a very good job, mashallah, bringing up her sons and daughters in the best way. She has, obviously, at that age, no responsibilities. She would listen to the Quran so often. She loves the Qur'an. She would listen to the Qur'an so often. And then she just said, why don't, I, why don't I take it a step further? So she said, I want to look at the Qur'an and just be able to see the word Allah. I, I want to recognize this word. So she asks her granddaughter, or grandson, sorry, grandson, please teach me how you write Allah. He taught her. So she, she would listen to, the Quran, uh, listen to a recitation on tape, and she would hold the mushaf, and she would follow the word Allah. As he says it, she follows. She, she says, he's here, he's here, he's here. That's it. That's how much she was attached to the Quran. Do you think this woman loves Allah so much? Apparently. Wait until you find out. <clears throat> she liked the fact that she could trace or follow the reciter with the word Allah, Allah. She wanted to learn more. So she asked her grandson to teach her the alphabet. She started, it, how old was she? 70. She started learning Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha. Then she learned how to connect them. Slowly, slowly, she could start follow the reciter as he read Quran. She was following and following him. Then she could read by herself. At the age of 75, she memorized the Quran. A lot of our younger brothers and sisters say, you know, I'm too old now, I'm, I'm 25. How can I memorize Quran? You know, if I, if I were six, seven years old, you know, I would have fresh memory and I would memorize. But now I'm old, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50. This woman was 70 when she started. At the age of 75, she memorized the whole Quran. She passed away, may Allah have mercy on her. She is the mother of two of the greatest scholars of our time. The author of the series I told you about, the six books, and his older brother, Muhammad al-Ashqar, Umar al-Ashqar, Muhammad al-Ashqar. One of them passed away three years ago, second one passed away a couple of months ago. May Allah have mercy on him. Okay. Where, where am I trying to get? And we might say, what does this have to do with Khushua? It all links in, okay? I'll take you to a statement to the Shaykh Abdul Rahman al Saadi. Shaykh Abdul Rahman al Saadi is the teacher or the Shaykh of Ibn Uthaymeen. And he's the author of the famous short Tafsir of the Quran, Taysir al Karim al Rahman. It's called Taysir al Karim al Rahman. Uh, has it been translated into English? Not yet. It's beautiful wonderful explanation and tafsir on the Qur'an. It's concise, but very deep at the same time. The Shaykh has a book, it's called Al-Bawahib Al-Rabbaniyya. In his book he says, Khushu' for, He says, for people who think Khushu' is a matter of Salah, they don't understand what Khushu' is. Khushu' is a state, is a continuous state of mind. He says, if you want khushu' in salah, 
You need to have it outside Salah. You need to have it outside Salah. Now, one of the contemporary du'a, famous one, mashallah, and these, Allah has given him a beautiful way to preach, uh, Sheikh Salih al-Maghamsi. Sheikh Salih al-Maghamsi has a beautiful statement, and it, when I listened to that statement, it just shook me, and it kept, it kept me in a state of shock for a couple of days. He says, Salah is a privilege. In Salah, you are standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are standing in the presence of Allah. And that's a privilege, an honor that Allah doesn't give to anyone. And on top of this, khushur is the pinnacle. So Allah would not give it to someone who contradicts the meaning of salah in his life. So he says, if you want khushur, you need to have khushur in your transactions. Khushur in the way you treat your brothers and sisters, your parents, and even everyone. You need khushur in doing your job. If you, if you walk in late, and you leave early, and if you waste your time in work, and you're getting, you're getting paid for it, you don't have khushu, you can, you, it's almost impossible for you to find khushu and salah. We thought it was irrelevant. It's all connected. It's all connected. Remember this. You will never have khushu in salah unless you have it in all aspects of your life. It's a this is why I like the brother's answer when he said connection to Allah. You cannot, you're not a machine. Okay? It's not like an internet connection. Okay, outside the masjid, you're disconnected, no internet access. And in the masjid, okay, go and check Wi-Fi's, Wi-Fi connections and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't work like that. We're not a machine. Humans have this tendency, it's our fitrah, to consistency. You are consistent. And Allah says, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّن قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah did not put two hearts to anyone in his chest. You don't have two hearts. You can't have two different orientations. Ultimately, you have to have one. You might have conflict, an inner conflict for a while, but ultimately, you will reach one. Just like as Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, hearts are different types. One that is completely you know, saturated with good orientations, noble orientations. And that's the heart that has light in it. And there's a heart that is completely saturated with evil orientations. And there's a heart in the middle. And nafs al in the middle. It's, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's there. He says, وَقَلْبٌ تَمُدُّهُ مَادَّتَانِ مَادَّةُ إِيمَانٍ وَمَادَّةُ كُفْرُ A heart that has two elements, iman and kufr. He says, فَهُوَ لِمَنْ غَلَبَ مِنْهُمَا Ultimately, one of them is going to take over. So you will have this inner conflict, but ultimately you will end up either here or there. Or there. But you can't be two people. So you can't be connected to Allah in the masjid and disconnected. So be sure someone who prays the five daily prayers in the masjid, reads Quran, and is excellent, Muslim, to be excellent Muslim. You deal with him, he lies, cheats, uh, disrespects others, etc. Be sure that is the same thing with salah, same thing with fasting. It has no essence, it's just a facade. It's a shell, empty shell. So you need to have khushu'ah, in salah, what do you do? You need to develop this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. It's simple. It falls in place. Just as the Prophet, as I said, the Prophet would not tell the companions, okay, do one, two, three, you'll have khushu' in salah. He didn't say, okay, do this and you will get that. No. He built a frame. And that's what Aisha said. Aisha radiallahu anha said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first said, don't drink alcohol, don't commit zina, they would have said, no, we won't do that. But she said, halal and haram were not revealed until later on. To build that frame first. Build that frame. Okay? Believe in, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understand what you're here for. What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be in this world? What does it mean? What's the point behind this? Understand more about Allah. Get to love Him. Get to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Then, when the Prophet or when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't drink alcohol, you say, absolutely, no problem. And that's exactly what the companions did. So it's not about instructions, it's about we are human beings, we're not machines. You program that machine just like a computer and that's it. 
No, it doesn't work like that. We are humans. So if you want to have khushu, you need to, guess what? Change your life. You need to align your life behind Salah. If you don't do that, khushu will be a far-fetched dream, a pie in the sky. You can't have khushu. I'm telling you, if you don't align your life behind Salah, if you don't align your life behind love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and decide to be a true Muslim, a true believer, you can never have khushu. You can just dream about it. And have a good time dreaming about it. Because you will never find the sweetness in salah. Salah, salah is a reflection of the rest of your life. That's what it is. So this is why I said, if you can hang it on the wall, that would be great. You think in salah about the things that you love most in life. That's what it is. So you need to know more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to know more. How do you do that? I said it's all these things together. You need to attach yourself to the Quran, read the Quran with more reflection. Reflect on the Quran. Try to, you know, learning 10 surahs without understanding really the real meanings, okay, is not a good thing. Learn one surah, learn the meanings, and try to implement them. See how they relate to, you, to who you are, to your life. Take it seriously. Okay? That's the only time you start learning. Learning, by the way, is not storing information. Learning is not storing information. Learning is being. If you don't absorb what you learn and it becomes part of who you are, if it doesn't mix with your blood and your flesh and it doesn't change you, you've wasted your time. Simple. If, if it doesn't change, if what you learn doesn't change you, it doesn't become part of your mental map, okay, you haven't learnt. It has to become part of you. It has to change you. Okay? So learning is being. It's a new state of being. That's what learning is. If you think it's just a mental process, you're not going to benefit. So you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. That's, that's not a simple thing to learn. You need to see that in everything you go through. Even when you get in trouble and it becomes really hard for you, if you, you've, if you have truly learned the meaning of Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, you would see the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that trial. You'd be able to see through. Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, when he was, he was in Damascus, in Asham, and the Khalifa of the Muslims who was in Egypt at the time, he sent troops to arrest Ibn Taymiyyah. And guess what they, they did? Ibn Taymiyyah was respected among his people. They uh, handcuffed him, and they were riding the horses, horses, and they were dragging him. He was on foot from Damascus to Cairo, which would take about 20 days to a month. As he was dragged out of his city, his own students were saying to him, Ya Imam, hadha awan al-sabr. Oh Imam, this is the time for patience. You remember you used to teach us about patience? Now it's your oppor golden opportunity to have patience. He looks at them and he says, La wallahi hadha awan al-shukr. He says, this is the time for thankfulness. Huh? He was on a different level. That's the time for thankfulness. He says, Wallahi, there is a sense of contentment in my heart that if it were to be distributed among the people of Damascus, it would be enough for each one of them. Why? He could see through. He could see through that plight. That's a man who really understood the, the, meaning, the meanings of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now that's a man, now I say, if he stands up in prayer, yeah, that, this kind of man would have khushwa. I'll answer the, one of the questions, or one of the things I promised you to answer. It was Imam Ahmad. Anyone who can remember, anyone remembers his statement? I, I mentioned a statement at the beginning and I said, I'll tell you who's the originator of the statement. Anyone can remember that statement? Excellent. What's your name, brother? Atif, mashallah. 
the manner in which you pray your prayer reflects where you are in paradise or we, where, you, where you are in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal that's Imam Ahmad's statement a lot of people say I, I wish I could know, you know where I will be in paradise and we have high hopes about that yeah <laughs> he says it's simple you want to know look at your prayer that's it just check your prayer are you thinking about uh, the, the, the next business project you have? You're thinking about your next journey. You're thinking about the woman you love. You think about uh, the money you lost last week. You're thinking about the next football game. You're thinking about you know, any of these you know, concerns, usual concerns, okay? In the prayer, and you say, yeah, I'll make it very close to the Prophet Sallallahu in paradise. You'll be joking yourself. Your concentration, your focus in prayer reflects where you are. So take it seriously. It's not a joke. And don't procrastinate. Don't say later on, I will. Because life never gives you the opportunity to focus on the prayer. Because there's shaitan who has dedicated his life just for your prayer. Just for that, what's his name? No, no, no the, now Iblis is the head of Shayateen. He's at the top of the hierarchy. But he has a lot of supporters and hel hel helpers and assistants. There's a Shaytan, his full time job is to distract you in the prayer. What's his name? Yes, Khinzab or Khinzib. Could be this or that. Khinzib or Khinzab. Yeah, that's your enemy. That's your enemy. So in the prayer, as soon as you say Allahu Akbar, you have engaged in a battle against the shaitan. You are in a battle against the shaitan. He is jumping up and down, approaching you left and right, reminding you of everything. One day someone came to, a famous story came to Imam Abu Hanifa and he said, you know, I had probably some money. I, I misplaced. I can't remember where I put that money. Or that thing. Can you help me? He said, simple. Just go to that corner, pray two rakahs, yeah, pray two rakahs, and Shaitan will tell you where you put that thing. <laughs> he went there, he started his prayer, and in the middle of prayer, oh, now I remember where I put it. And he forgot about the prayer. You see how Shaitan, Khinzab, yeah. we need to be more. Uh, enthusiastic about our salah just as Khinzab is enthusiastic about distracting you he's working from the he's working full heartedly to distract you from the prayer okay so now first thing prayers the Prophet ﷺ prayed second thing is what get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala read the Quran everything that happens in your life try to find out what is Allah's wisdom there and be sure that Allah plans something good for you. The Prophet says in the authentic hadith, لا يقضي الله لعبده المؤمن قضاء إلا وهو خير له. There is nothing that Allah causes to happen to his believing servant except that it is good for him. Very comprehensive statement. Anything that Allah causes to happen to you, if you are a believer in Allah, it is good for you. But it's in our problem, or it's in our short-sightedness that sometimes we don't see through things. Okay, so getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me move to number three, simple. When you pray, which direction do you take? Qibla. You take the Qibla. That's for your body. That's for your body. We are according to some classification, we are, have physical reality and spiritual reality, our souls. They are, the heart is connected to the soul, mainly. And it's the, it, it is the connection point, okay? And it controls the body. Now your heart impacts your body, and your body impacts your heart and your soul. So, this is why I said, pray as the Prophet ﷺ prayed, it has an impact on your heart. It helps you develop more khushwa. Now, the direction of Qibla was not chosen just like that haphazardly. 
obviously in science they could, they could find out some secrets in this, fine. But, there is something about human behavior that if you feel good, there are physical signs. There are physical signs. And if you feel down, there are other physical signs. If you feel energetic, okay, you'll find your shoulders up. Just like that, your head is up, you puff up your chest, yeah? You just feel it. It's, it, it. You don't do that deliberately, it just happens. And if you feel down, you'll find your shoulders just like that. The interesting thing is, Let's try this exercise. <clears throat> I just want you to think about a moment where you felt everything was going perfect and life was so rosy, more than you want it to be. You felt so much, you know, so much happiness about it. Everything seemed to be perfect. Just think about that moment, please. If you, if you close your eyes, it's going to be even better. Close your eyes. If you don't want to, that's okay. Okay? And... I want you to go back to that moment. Just go back to it. Khushu, by the way, is a state of mind. So if you go through this exercise, it's going to get you a bit closer to what I'm talking about. Think about a moment that was the most intriguing moment in your life. It's the best moment in your life. Think about it. It could be when you went for Hajj. It could be when, when you, you know, made some good money. It depends. Okay, done. I want you now to think about the most miserable moment in your life. Most miserable moment when you felt down, nothing was working out, and it all seemed to be, you know, hopeless. Please go back into that state, relive it. Just relive it. Please go completely into that state of mind. I could see a pattern. Okay, done. I could see a pattern. But I'm sure if you focus enough, you can feel it. When you were thinking about the best moment in your life, how did you feel? How was your body? I could see a lot of you, the heads were up. Surprisingly, as you started thinking about the worst moment in your life, I could see the heads were going down. We are linked. We're just like that. We're human beings. Okay? So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us perform the prayer in a certain way, it has an impact on our state of mind. It has an impact, okay, on our hearts. So when you face the Qibla, all Muslims face the Qibla, there's a sense of unity that brings the Muslims together. We're all directed to the same direction, the same spot. Something more important, you physically face the Qibla, so it's one direction, and that, that's some kind of direction to your heart to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your face or your body faces the Qibla, your heart faces Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what, it, what, what the Qibla means. Your heart faces Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will just share a couple of points and I will wrap up very quickly. I will give you a secret, a very, very, very big secret. People will tell you so many things about khushu' and how to develop khushu' in life. Oh, in salah. I think you know, the, some of the tips that we gave are enough. Praise the Prophet ﷺ prayed. Learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so your love, your love for Allah increases. And probably I could, you could make it a point. Uh, remember that thing, when you, when you face the Qibla, your heart is meant to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet says, إِذَا نَصَبَ الْعَبْدُ وَجْهَهُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ يَنْصِبُ نَفْسَهُ قُبَالَتَهُ This hadith is profound. When the believer stands up in the prayer, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places that servant in his presence facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you stand in prayer Allah faces you when you stand in prayer Allah faces you and the worst thing you could do is that Allah faces you with attention and your mind is somewhere else how bad does it feel you're talking to someone and his mind, his mind is somewhere else you would take offense won't you and imagine if you're talking to someone and he turns around as if you're not talking how many people do this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's Allah one day there's a story mentioned by uh, uh, Imam al in Sirah Alam al Nubala. He says there was a group of people. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. I mentioned this here. Could be in this masjid. Uh, a group of people who were traveling at night. They came to this valley and it was there were some woods. So they were getting themselves ready to sleep. As they were preparing themselves, a lion came about. So they jumped up onto the trees, taking shelter. But there was one person who had already started his Qiyam al-Layl, who was praying Qiyam al-Layl. The lion came, the man did not move. He kept praying. So the lion was walking around, he turned around the guy, and then he left. When these guys came down, they said, you're crazy. And by the way, I'm just paraphrasing, I'm using my own words. <laughs> Put it in, in context. They said, the lion was here, you didn't move. He said, Wallahi, I felt shy that I'm standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I fear something else. Istahyaytu min Allah an aqifa bayna yadayh thumma akhafu khalqan man khalqih. I was shy that I stand in front of Allah and I fear one of his creation. What level of focus on khushu'a that is? Very high. Okay, now I'll give you the big secret. And that's what I will, will conclude with. <clears throat> this secret is mentioned in the Quran, but indirectly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ The believers are successful. They are the ones who are, who have khushu'a in their prayer. They have khushu' in their prayer. Now, some of the scholars of tafsir say, yes, this is the first description of the believers. So if you want to know, just for yourself, if this person has iman or not, look at his prayer. If he has khushu', that's a good sign. If he doesn't have khushu', okay, that's not a good sign. But the important point here is that the reason for their khushu' is iman. Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ In Arabic, the sequence of the descriptions has logic to it. So why did Allah say, these believers are successful? They are the ones who have khushu' in salah. The scholars of tafsir say, that means, okay, iman is the essence, and these are the signs of iman. They have khushu' in salah, the first one. So the more iman you have, the more khushu' you're going to have. A second sign or indirect, uh, or some kind of insinuation in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ And seek help in patience and the prayer. Indeed, it is the prayer very difficult. It's a burdensome uh, duty on people except for the khashi'een. Only the khashi'een find it easy to perform. Then Allah describes the khashi'een. وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ وَأَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ That's the secret of khashu'a. That's a sign by the way. الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ The khashi'een, what is their description? They have faith and conviction that they will return to Allah and meet Allah 
and that they will re- uh, they are the ones who have conviction that they will meet Allah and they will return unto him that's it that's the secret of khushu'a if you truly believe that you will meet Allah on the day of judgment and that's your ultimate destiny that's the most important point in your future the, the moment you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day the more belief you have about this the more khushu'a you will have in salah period that's the secret of khushu'a now if you have more patience I'll explain it to you but I would like to leave it at that but if you want to know more I can break it down but it's gonna take me another five minutes I've been talking for about an hour <laughs> one hour twenty minutes that's enough but if you would like more we could give it but generally speaking the more iman you have about your meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment the more for sure you will have five minutes carry on okay if you're gonna take five minutes those who would like to leave they can leave you're free to leave please I mean uh, there's no obligation this is uh, it's not a secret only about salah it's the secret about everything we do and I got the secret I'll tell you where from it's in the Quran but the one who uses it best is shaitan <laughs> shaitan knows human nature shaitan is an expert on human behavior isn't he isn't he <laughs> most of humanity has gone astray shaitan knows how to manipulate humans and how to change their behavior there are two things that control us two things Two things control our lives, control everything we do. Two things. Shaitan used them to get Adam السلام, and Eve to eat from the tree. Imagine Allah put Adam and Eve in paradise. You get everything you want. Paradise. I mean, that's not a joke. Paradise. You get everything there in paradise. You're there in paradise. Do what you want. Take what you want wish for what you want and you will get it whatever you want you will get but leave this tree alone never come near it that's it shaitan managed to get adam and eve to go and eat from that tree despite their belief in allah their devotion their knowledge about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and despite their willingness and determination to remain in paradise what could be better? What could be possibly be be better than that? He pulled two strings, two strings, and they are mentioned in Surah Al-A'la. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reprimands humanity. He says, "Bal tu'thiroon al-hayat al-dunya." You prefer this worldly life, wal akhiratu khairu wa abqa. And the akhirah, that next life, is better is better goodness and more everlasting it's everlasting these are the two things that control our behavior what did shaitan say to adam alayhi salam in order to get him to eat from that tree he said hal adulluka ala shajarat al khuldi Shall I not guide you or show you the tree that will grant, grant you eternal life? Khuld. And kingship. You become the king, the ultimate king. Or you get everything you want, which is goodness. Whatever you want, you get it. You get the top quality of everything. And Adam ate from the tree. So that's what, what affects our behavior. The time horizon of something and its level of goodness. We always aim for the best and what lasts more. If you link these two things to salah, 
you will have complete focus. Complete focus. If you believe, and that's what Imam al-Ghazali says in Ihya Ulum al-Din, subhanAllah, he has, he has a small, small section on Salah, he mentions that is so powerful. So powerful. He just says, if you truly get yourself to believe that Allah is better for you and your relationship with Allah is more everlasting and you know the prayer is the vehicle to that, you could never think of anything else during your salah. Think about it. If someone told you, I'll give you a job and you will get a thousand pounds a month and it's for three years and they will give you another job for 20 years and you will get 5,000 a month. Which one would you choose? Apparently, apparently, we choose things. And by the way, when a person falls into zina, when a person falls into zina, do you know they go through a state of mind? Do you know what it is? They think that desire, it's tacit. I know it's tacit. But they cannot think of anything other than this feeling or this uh, enjoyment that they're going to have. And at that moment, it seems everlasting. It seems everlasting. The same with riba, the same with any sin. Shaitan, shaitan will always give you the impression, okay, that this thing is everlasting. You might not think about it necessarily on a clear level, but deep inside, you, you can only see the sin. You can only see the enjoyment, sorry, in the enjoyment of that sin. And for some reason, it seems to be there. It seems that that's what I want, and it's going to be there forever. That's the inner logic that goes through your mind. And subhanAllah, surprisingly, just a couple of months ago, I was reading, and I found out that this is a psychological uh, phenomenon. And they called it, uh, obviously, they discovered it with a, with a, with a different, uh, in a different area, but they call, they call it, for example, uh, what do they call it? Learned optimism. Learned optimism. The opposite of it is learned helplessness. Some people who, fall, who always fail doing things, they think that's the story of their lives. It's gonna, gonna, there will be failures forever. They say, whatever I make is not going to, uh, won't work. That's learned helplessness. It becomes everlasting. Shaitan always plays with our time horizon. So when you are about to fall in sin, he just puts you under the impression that you don't see beyond it. So it seems that's your whole life there. So you feel it's, it will, it's something you, you can never live without. But you don't realize, once you fall in that sin, it's just like someone punched you in the face. It's gone. The beauty of it is gone, and now you have to, to live with that pain. Okay. We keep, we keep falling into the same trick again and again. So remember, whatever you do, you do it because deep down in your heart, you believe it is better and it is more lasting. That's what we do. If you can link that to the prayer, yeah, think about your business project, you're starting to pray, shaitan comes to you, it's my, your business project, you know the other customer, he might not come today. Hurry up because there's a meeting. What are you going to say in the meeting? You're not ready for it. Yeah? Compare the salah to that business meeting. How long is it going to last you? Business meeting. Two years later, you won't even think about it. It's, it's part of the past. But what about the salah? It's more everlasting. It's my connection to Allah. It has to do with the hereafter. It's not only this world. So if, if you use this kind of logic, you will be surprised how much focus will start to gravitate to, to the salah. The same thing to your prayer. That's the real business deal. I'm doing it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who has more resources than Allah? Who controls my, all my resources in business? Who controls all this opportunity? Who brings it about? It's Allah. You're dealing with the source now. All the business, all the money, all the money, all the opportunity in this world. Where does it come from? It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're dealing with the source. Imagine like, you'd, let's say someone, could, like the richest person in the world is offering you an interview and he says, I'll give you whatever you ask for. And you have a friend 
who earns a thousand pounds a month and he, he saves only a hundred pounds and probably has savings five thousand and you want to build a business project and this richest man in the world says to you okay what do you want you say I don't have time for you I'll go for my friend and I'll, I'll get the five thousand but would you, how would you describe this kind of per person? <coughs> Same thing. You are standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who owns everything, who creates everything, who has created everything. And all the opportunities in the world come from Him. Resourcefulness is with Allah. And eternity is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So always compare that, compare anything you, you are about, you're thinking about with, with the salah regarding these two criteria and you will start to develop more khushwa but obviously you need to put all of these things together praise the Prophet and pray uh, and learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, remember that when you are facing Qibla your heart is facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is facing you and fourth make sure that you believe in the hereafter and Salah is your vehicle to that success, the only vehicle to that success. And the final point, and the most important to me, is basically the everlasting success and the best success is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever you wish for, whatever your mind is connected to, it ultimately goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ask it from Allah. So inshallah this would help you develop more khushu'ah. There's a lot that could be said about khushu'ah. And uh, just I will conclude with this notion which I mentioned before. Remember that khushu' is not restricted to the prayer. It's a way of life. It's a mindset. It's a state of mind. It's a continuous stream. If you don't keep up with it throughout in your different activities in life, you will not be able to command it at the time you will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. What would you say comes first, um, the Salah first to develop the Khushu, or the Khushu first to, you know, develop the, because Allah SWT says in Surah uh, Al-Kabur that the Salah stops you from doing uh, sins yeah. and evil. So. Yeah, uh, the same rule of the upward spiral works. It's the same story of the, uh, the egg and the the chicken, which came first? That's, it's the same thing. Uh, which, which one do you need to fix first, your heart or your actions? Well, they all feed into each other. Yeah, It's the same thing, your salah. All the things that we mentioned feed into each other. So you, say, you might say, which one to start with? A anyone you find you are more naturally inclined to do or you are already doing, get it, take it as a starting point and then try to incorporate the other points we mentioned inshallah there's no starting point f for everyone Every, you know everybody is, is good at one point so take that as, as your starting point some people are so much connected to the Quran take this as your starting point to learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, some people uh, probably have khushu already in the prayer a level of khushu I would say but outside they tend to they tend to break from it. Now try to keep it. And so on and so forth. Okay, when yes. It's not related to the, the subject, but it's related to the <coughs> dress code when you're feeling. Nowadays you see all of these youngsters, I've seen some old people as well, half sleeves, belt, the quality bit of bottom, you know, the bottom, the trousers right at the bottom, and you can see. Yeah. So what's the dress code on those? Uh, Generally speaking, uh, the dress code has to cover the aura properly. It has to cover the aura properly. It has to be as well, it has to show your respect. The respect factor that you're standing before Allah subhanahu Because some people <coughs> pray in their uh, pajamas. I mean, okay, it covers the aura fine, but would you go on and meet someone important? Would you go to a business meeting with your pajamas on? Obviously not. So it's more a bit reflective. The cultural factor comes in here because in different countries it could be different. 
So uh, generally speaking, as, lo as long as it covers the awra, and there is something specific about the awra in salah. Awra in salah, it covers, okay, from the navel to the knees, down to the knees, but your shoulders are included in salah. Because there's a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Naha Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you salli al rajul, bithawbi laysa ala atiqihi minhu shay. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited that someone prays without having his garments covering his shoulders. So it should be covering the shoulder. Okay. And uh, uh, some of the shirts or fanelas, they might be very thin here. What do you call them? Above the elbow. Yeah, no problem. Like if you have a shirt uh, up to here, no problem. Yeah, no problem. As long as the shoulders are covered, no problem. Yeah. Tight trousers are a problem. A very common problem now is people not necessarily having you know, these uh, trousers that hang below, but sometimes it's uh, when you go for sujood, some people have a, uh, wear a short shirt, and when they go for sujood, their back shows, and sometimes their backside shows. This could, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and this could actually make the, turn their the prayer invalid. This could invalidate their prayer. If the backside shows and you don't cover it swiftly, forget about this prayer. Forget it. You'll be surprised on the Day of Judgment. So make sure your back and your backside don't show. A lot of the younger ones mainly do it. Our younger brothers, they do it. Make sure your back is covered. That's a very common thing. And subhanAllah, worldwide, with all Muslims, yeah, especially the younger ones, you will find wherever you go to a masjid, some people they have their backs or even the backside, as I said, showing. That's a very serious thing. First, it signifies disrespect. You, I mean, you're standing before Allah, you're bowing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's. it's I mean, it's inappropriate. And what about people praying behind you? It d obviously distracts them. And you're not covering your awra, and which is the, like, the awra al mughallada That's like the, that's the awra that you should never expose whatsoever. So be sure that you're, you're covered well. But for the, like, shirts above the elbows, no problem, inshallah. But and don't forget, the trousers, they should not be tight. They should not be tight. It should be baggy, loose, yeah? Jazakum Allah khair. I didn't have time to get there, but khushu and intention are two sides of the same coin. Intention has to do with your belief in Allah. The more belief you have in Allah, the more belief you have, the more you believe you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this prayer connects you directly to Allah, that's intention. So the more khushu you'll have, and have time to. But it was mentioned, in the impl you know, indirectly in the talk. Yes, it does. Intention and khushu are two sides of the same coin. Uh, someone had another question. Yes. Yeah. Okay, the brother asked, I keep my eyes closed, uh, closed during Salah, that gives me more khushu'a. Uh, we say, خير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم The best guidance is the guidance of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So we see what, how did the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم pray. One day the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was praying to a wall and a goat was about to cross. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم got close to the wall and he made the goat cross from behind him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you prays, let him have a sutra, like these ones, yeah? And this is something people, that has, by the way, that contributes to khushu'a. When you have something in front of you like this, Paul, okay, like this stick, it helps you with khushu'a. And a lot of the scholars say it is obligatory. In Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet said, إِذَا صَلَّى أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيُصَلِّي إِلَىٰ سُتْرَ وَلْيَدْنُ مِنْهَا If one of you prays, let him have a sutra in front of him and let him be close to it. So a lot of the scholars say it's an obligation. Okay. Uh, another hadith, the Prophet said, uh, and, and, sorry, in this hadith, the Prophet said, and if someone tries to 
pass or cross in front of him, let him push him back. And if he insists, let him fight with him. Another hadith the Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you prays and he sees a scorpion, let him kill it, or a snake, let him kill it. My question is, could you do that if you have your eyes closed? You won't be able to do that. So that's a strong indication that the Prophet ﷺ would keep his eyes open. The Prophet's prayer وسلم, was described in, ex in extreme detail and none of the authentic hadith, as far as I know, mentioned the Prophet, that the Prophet ﷺ closed his, his eyes. Even the manner in which he would speak, the, the, the spot where he would put his eye, the movement of his finger was described specifically in detail. So it seems apparently there's strong evidence that the Prophet ﷺ would not keep his eyes closed in the prayer. Now the reason you find more khushu' is that because you are used to it. What you should be doing is find a good spot for your khushu' and make sure that you look at, this, at, the, at, the, at the spot of where you put your forehead in the salah. Try to make this your focal point and contemplate what you are saying, the, the, the ayat and the verses, contemplate their meanings. Inshallah, you will, you will move to a different level of khushu' inshallah. The best book is the book of Sheikh Al-Bani, yeah, the, prophet, the Prophet's Prayer Described. And it's available in English, so it's been translated. And there's a summary, there's a, an abridged uh, edition of this book as well. It's been translated also into English. So it's the best book. Uh, there is uh, a small book from Sheikh Ibn Baz, a small she a book from Sheikh Ibn Al-Thaymeen. Both are excellent as well. They've been translated as well, small books. Yeah. No questions? Anything from the sister's side? Nothing? Okay. Okay. You have to go. Back to the uh, dress code question. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> there's a hadith where uh, the Prophet said, don't roll your garments over, as in that the... Yes. Can you sort of uh, just yeah, explain? Yeah. Okay. yeah, so the last question, we're done then, inshallah. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Just explain the... Uh... Rolling up sleeves or trousers in, in, the, in the salah, it should not be the case. There's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, نَهَانِي رَبِّي أَنْ أَكُفَّ ثَوْبًا أَوْ أَعْقِصَ شَعْرًا فِي الصلاة. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited me from rolling up any part of my clothes or tying my hair in salah. So those who have long hair, sometimes they tie it. In the prayer, you have, just before you start, you have to untie it. Okay? Rolling up the sleeves and the trousers as well. Uh, some scholars say it's prohibited. Some scholars say it's disliked. Makruh. Okay? So both opinions are there. The opinion that says it's prohibited is stronger because the statement is so clear. Allah prohibited me. And whatever the Prophet is prohibited, we are prohibited. That's a rule in Usul al-Fiqh. So I would say you should avoid it completely. Don't roll up your sleeves or your trousers. Avoid doing that. And now I know some people do it because they've heard a hadith where it says that in salah you should not have isbal. Your trousers or your garment should not go below, below your ankles. But this hadith is weak. That relates isbal to the prayer. Isbal, there are two opinions as well. The strongest is that it's prohibited. Okay? regardless of your intention. Uh, but isbal is a problem in salah and outside salah. The hadith that links it to the salah is not authentic, it's a weak hadith. Okay? So it should be, you should not roll up your sleeves or your trousers okay. during the prayer. Even, even, no, even generally, generally? No, generally you could do that. No, like I could, I could roll up my sleeves now and give the talk. It's only in salah. The problem is in salah. Yeah. And you keep it uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, the brother asks if, if you usually roll up your trousers. I honestly don't know. If there's anything linked to this, fine. If another topic, inshallah, we'll deal with the questions sometime later. Same topic? Uh, yeah, same topic. Yeah. clarification as regards to tying the hair, is that for women as well? Or is that just for women? Uh, the scholars say it's for men. Yeah, because it's difficult for women to untie their hair, yes. Yeah. Barakallah fikum. Okay. Jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.